because one of the lectures uh Emmanuel Block is would miss it otherwise if he did it today. And it'd be nice to include them in the photos so that we'll wait tomorrow and Okay. How with yourself? Huh? Now you can get your shirt if you want. You completely coordinated. Order things. Good. Good to go. All right. Good morning guys if it's still morning coming up closer to noon thanks for coming back for day two and uh, i think today we'll continue from where we left off yesterday in lecture one and go a little deeper we'll do a little bit more uh, derivations some high level messages and uh, just as yesterday you know feel free to completely bombard me with questions and uh, to rehash for everyone where you can find things. And today I'm going to have to figure out which screen to point at since there's two of them, but let's start with this one. Um, for those of you also watching, I guess on YouTube, this is where you can find uh, all of the material. So I thought we'd start with a little bit of a Q and A, but flipped as usual. Uh, which is uh, what were some things that you guys thought you took away from the lecture yesterday so far? It would be great to get a couple ideas. So feel free to raise your hand or shout it out. Yes. <laughs> the probabilistic air cancellation is magic. Thank you very much. And I hope to begin to unravel some of that magic today. We'll see just how far down the rabbit hole we will go, but I hope to uh, to get a little deeper into it. Any other comments? Steve? Let me ask a question to see if I understand the main message from this today. So let's say you have rare bit flip and is a sort of cartoon version of the story that the uh, zero noise extrapolation is you throw in some more X errors and you add them. And in the scheme you talked about yesterday, you subtract. <laughs> yeah, the question is we looked at the two main techniques to use in error mitigation. One was uh, zero noise extrapolation, one was probabilistic error cancellation. Steve is saying, you know, it looks like in one case you. Um, increase your error in zero noise extrapolation, you add more gates usually, or you stretch the gates and you make your results worse, but you can kind of back out how the noise is affecting your results. And hopefully that gives you the right answer. There's no rigorous guarantee here, but hopefully it works pretty well. And practically it tends to work pretty well. Not amazing, but quite well. In PEC, in probabilistic error cancellation, you're actually wanting to truly cancel the errors on average. But you do so by injecting more errors into each individual instance of your circuit being run. And so, yes, you are canceling the errors, but you're only doing so on average, not in each trajectory. Uh, so in, in the average sense, yes, but in the individual trajectory sense, you're, you're just adding more noise. And we'll get into a nice analogy today. Good. Thank you, Steve. Hopefully that begins to get at it. You have one more thing? Basically, it seems like you're just measuring the impact of your error to then subtract that impact from your measurement result. Isn't it? So you're inducing the error to measure the outcome, and you subtract that then from your measurement result. Yeah, I think the, the question is, in these techniques, am I uh, inducing an error, seeing what that effect is, and subtracting it out? Yes, but the thing is that in your ground truth, case in the case where you just run the calculation of the quantum computer the error is always there and it's unknown so you don't you can't subtract it because you don't know it unless you do something like pc where you actually learn the noise which is what we'll talk about today which is the big challenge we admitted yesterday um you uh you need to either know your noise or you kind of need to add more noise and kind of work your way backwards with some assumptions is that Kind of, yes. Yeah, one more.
Mm -hmm. That's right. Ah. Yeah. I Right. So the question is, okay, if I know what P, the probability of an error is, if I know my error model, why can't I just simulate the whole quantum circuit, including the errors, do Limblad uh, evolution? At the end, I just do tomography of my system. And because I know what it is, I can invert it in post-processing. Okay. Yes. And that's right if you're thinking like a quantum optics person, where by quantum optics, I mean you have one, two, three qubits. Where we want to go is many body systems. So you can't do tomography on 124 qubits. It's, it's basically infeasible. Um, we're also thinking of circuits increasingly that are going to be beyond what you can simulate classically or analytically solve. That's where we want to go. And so we're really looking at those regimes that become intractable for some other reason so that we're moving beyond kind of the simple picture. And then the question is, what can you do in practice in the device without having access to the full uh, simulation without being able to know what the quantum state is at the end of the day. Does that help answer it? Yes, okay, good, great. Um, so to kind of take a quick peek at what we covered yesterday, we started with the big picture, why quantum computers, why are mitigation, and then really it touched on the different ways that you can get more juice out of the lemon. So we started with uh, the progress in the field of quantum computers where, you know, we, we started with one or two qubits. Now in the superconducting realm, we're sort of at the 100, 400 qubit level. And then um, looking outward, the vision is to really scale to very large systems. The biggest problem, as most of you pointed out, is noise. Noise corrupts your calculation. In the circuits, we're going to increasingly care about the the calculation will be so complicated that we can't do it on our laptop. And we introduced uh, at least two extremes of the uh, error mitigation landscape that can correct errors that, uh, or that can try to give you an unbiased estimate where the bias is induced by the noise in the device. And we zoomed in uh, on a landscape of what these mitigation techniques have achieved to date in terms of circuits that are defined by their width, how many qubits you have, and circuits defined by their depth, which is how deep are the circuits in number of two qubit gates. And that led us to focus on probabilistic error cancellation as the sort of gold standard technique that should, in principle, always give you a rigorous bias, uh, unbiased estimate of what you truly want, some expectation value. And then we started introducing the ideas of probabilistic error cancellation in this toy model example. So today we'll pick up uh, where we left off yesterday with the probabilistic error cancellation, kind of summarizing the derivation we did at the end of the lecture. It can be a little abstract, so I'll try to draw an analogy to classical random walks to give you a bit more of a flavor conceptually of what it does. There were several questions around error bars and how can you trust this at the end of the day? So I'll try to introduce, um, I added this here to introduce a little bit more about how to think of being confident in the data you get out of the quantum machine. If there is interest in time, we can sort of do the really professional level derivation of this. I think this is optional, but when we get to that point, I'll see how much interest there is in really kind of going at, going beyond the toy model and sort of doing this the way you would do it in an academic paper. The question that somebody raised already here today is, you assume you know the noise. Now that's not an easy assumption to make. You have to prove to me you can do that and you can do it faithfully. So how do we do that? Now it turns out, and I haven't mentioned this yet, but in this whole probabilistic error cancellation paper from that, uh, that I started maybe one, a few years ago, the first part you've seen so far, this was the easy part. This, this was more or less already known. What was really hard and the reason nobody else could 
do this in practice is because learning the quantum noise is really, really hard. And so actually two years, it took about two years to figure out how to do that in practice in the real devices. And that's really where the crux of the actual challenge is experimentally. So we'll touch on that and uh, introduce you to the big ideas of how to understand that noise. Now, if you know the noise on your quantum computer, you can also use it to do, for instance, open quantum system simulations, uh, looking at Lindblad evolution. There's a number of proposals out today. So there's many more reasons that you would want to understand and tailor the noise on your quantum device beyond mitigation. You can actually use that to do quantum simulation as well. And then uh, at the end, we'll put it together to see how well does it work in practice and what are some experiments. And we'll look at an Ising uh, time evolution. And then that will finally lead us into the big picture. So how does this inform the next five, 10 years? And then I think in lecture three, we'll probably finish off some of this and go into a, a real experiment uh, and using these techniques in practice to look at uncovering these local integrals of motion in a flow case system in a 2D lattice and looking at transition from ergodic dynamics to MBL dynamics purportedly that you've already heard from, from David Hughes and others earlier in the, in the series. Good, okay, so back to the deep dive. If you remember, the idea is that there's noise in the environment. If you can characterize that noise, you can, in essence, noise canceling headset and cancel that noise on average. And we introduce this notion of a toy model where you have a noise channel lambda that will contract your sphere and will try to take all the pure states and push them towards some fixed point. And that's bad because we lose purity, we lose information. The way to combat that is to, in principle, introduce its inverse channel, which isn't a channel. It's, a, it's an operation that's, in principle, un unphysical. However, we can try to implement this evolution, uh, this dilation on average. And part of the trick here is that we're looking at the average evolution. You see that the, uh, the Lindblad equation, the evolution of the density matrix is a deterministic process. And so we can create another deterministic process to undo that since uh, you know, if you know how the noise is acting, you in principle know exactly how much to dilate by. And I think that was the earlier question, which is why can't I just do this in, a, in my classical computer? And the challenge will be that, well, you want to do that, but on circuits that are ones that I can't simulate on my classical computer. So then I need to, somehow implement that in a real physical quantum machine. We did what every physicist likes to do, which is to take a guess and see if it works. So we took an ansatz uh, with probabilities uh, here Q, which turned out to not be probabilities. One thing that several people pointed out, which is excellent observation, is that in this entire thing, the entire idea critically hinges on knowing P, the probability of an error. In other words, on knowing the noise channel. And so that's where the second half of this lecture will go is to see how do you actually figure that out? How do you know P with really, really high precision? But for now, assume we know it. And then uh, this is roughly towards the end of yesterday's lecture. We said, if you unravel, this kind of ansatz guess into its possibilities. And I should mention when you unravel quantum trajectories, there are multiple unravelings. These, this is not a unique unraveling, but it doesn't really matter because we only look at average quantities and on average, any unraveling will do the same. So we said that the noise can have an I or X, it's a bit flip channel. The inverse can also either apply an I or an X. And in two cases, we saw that there's a lot of uh, bad error that can occur. And we want to ideally interfere these destructively. The core idea here is that you can't interfere quantum trajectories unless you introduce signs. And that's where we found this expression that the quasi probability of inverting uh, 
of uh, applying the X gate is negative P over one minus two P, the negative sign being crucial and the rest having to do with the normalization. From there, we define this quasi-probability distribution that said with some new probability PI defined from the absolute value of the, the coefficient, normalized by the L1 norm or somehow the, the total norm of the coefficients of the noise, uh, we, we can create this probability to sample the identity. Notice, by the way, that if lambda was a unitary channel or if it was an identity or something else, the, the norm here would be one. So if there's no noise, gamma is one. And if there is noise, gamma gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so this is what I mean here by a quasi-probability distribution, not the same thing as a Wigner function, but this is a different type of quasi-probability, but sort of it's the same general idea. Good. Maybe let me pause and check in. Any questions on this so far? Okay. How do you actually implement this in practice? The idea is, was that you can um, use the linearity of the trace to pull out the coefficients of P and Q. And that allows you to then apply the sign and post-processing on the classical bits of actual quantum circuits. The way you ensure the probability is you can sample these with uh, this P sub i and P sub x. Of course, if you have only two circuits, you might as well run both of them and just get the result. The challenge is that when you have uh, n qubits, the number of circuits, the, the noise here will grow and these number of circuits will grow exponentially and you won't possibly be able to run all of them. So that's why we're introducing this idea of sampling circuits. Now from the output of these two circuits that you can run and execute, you combine the values in this simple but clever way so as to exactly construct a, an estimator right, a, a, a random variable that it, on average will exactly equal the expectation value of the observable we care about in the absence of noise. And that comes from lambda inverse lambda. So that's really the goal. This is what we wanted to achieve is a bias-free estimator. However, and this is what we didn't get to touch on quite as much, is that there's a factor gamma right in front of the estimator. If you think about now the variance of this, of this quantity, which will come through the fact that M here, that's the outcome of one of these, uh, that's, that's this uh, outcome say of this measurement, can be either plus one or minus one or zero or one if you want. That's a random number, it's a random variable, uh, but now you're scaling it by a factor of gamma. So if you look at the variance of that expression, the variance will grow with gamma squared. Since uh, you know, multiplying a random number by a constant will lead to the variance going quadratically in the constant. Standard deviation just scales like the constant. And that's important because what that tells us is that for the same number of shots, we have to sample a lot more in order to get the same precision. Right, if the variance is higher, that means the error bar is higher. So you want a smaller error bar, so you need to sample more. Um, and, the, and that is going to be determined by gamma, which is the strength of the noise. Gamma is also the damping factor. It tells you how much things will decay. Good, maybe let me check in if there are any questions. Yeah, quick question. Yes, uh, the question is, what do I mean by a bias-free estimate? Okay, let me try to maybe write this out on the board. Okay, maybe this is worth a quick comment. Right, so notice that what we did is we, we said that we defined a quantity, let's call it E, which is going to be equal to gamma, times uh, the sine on i, uh, the probability, well, sorry, there's no probability here. 
I should I should write it like this. Let's call it x for some random variable i. So x x i will be a variable that will be say either minus one or plus one, and it's randomly determined by. Um, or maybe let's if we if to make it easier, it's probably easier to just do zero and one for now. You can think of them as polys, but it's easier to work with zeros and ones. Um, so then the probability of xi to equal uh, to equal one, okay, is going to oops, there we go, is going to equal uh, the the trace of sort of of uh, one one with the final state of the system, which in this case uh, with you know row final. Let's call it row i, which in this case is just uh, the initial state propagated through that circuit. So it's just lambda rho. So that's lambda is the noisy operator, and and rho is this. And similarly, now the the second part of this piece is that now we can add the sine of x. Um, let's say with x x. XX is just the classical output of the second uh, circuit. And in that case, the probability of, of XX to equal one will be equal to uh, just the trace of, again, one, one, which you know I can write as the measurement operator. So let's call it mu hat of one. So mu hat of one is the same thing as one, one here. That's the POVM, if you want, times the final state rho, which in this case will be lambda x rho x, like this. And now, if you if you take the expectation value, the classical expectation value over over this quantity up here, which uh, I'll define as e, that's going to give us gamma um, multiplied by, I should, I should, so maybe I should have also mentioned here, I'm assuming I've already ran the two circuits with equal probability. So let me rephrase that a little bit. I should add the probability here I, because here I'm going to run both of them. If I didn't, I would have only one of these. Then I would have a random variable that has two indices. It has which circuit did I run and what was the outcome. And then when I do this expectation value, I would get a probability here. But because there are only two circuits, maybe it's easy to, to directly add the probability there. So it's the same thing as if we had averaged the single outcome over the different trajectories. And so what I mean by this is that now if I take gamma uh, times here, uh, pi uh, times si, the expectation value here of of i uh, plus uh, gamma px sx the expectation value of of x xx if you add these in what you see is that you can substitute these expressions from above in here I could walk through it if you want, but uh, and then you use the decomposition we had earlier. So you notice gamma pi si. That's just equal to the coefficient of one minus it, that equal the trace. And I could walk through the steps. Let me know if you want me to. But it will equal the trace of, let's say, um, the trace of the thing we care about, let's say the Z expectation value, if, if that's my observable that I'm rescaling everything to. And then it will be um, the, the ideal gate that we want it to apply, then lambda, lambda inverse, and then rho in. So you, you and then uh, your lambda and lambda inverse will cancel. And so this will then give you just the trace of z rho n, 
which is our ideal uh, expectation value. Or let's just call it Z ideal. Okay. Good. Any question on that? Oh, what would be not a but? What, okay. Yeah, the question is, so, okay, this is good. Yesterday, we did it from the other side where we started with the quantum channels and just found the expectation value. Today, we started, if you want, with the classical variables that are the outcomes and link them back up to the quantum channels. So there's a correspondence between the two. What wouldn't be a biased estimator is if, for instance, you didn't get lambda inverse here, you got something else. And then in here, you would have you would have some other channel, let's call it epsilon of rho n, that would be a biased estimator. Um, and in other protocols like Zini or so on, you, you don't get this exact value. Basically anything that isn't this value, if these two channels didn't precisely cancel, then that would be a biased estimator because it doesn't give you the, the true Z ideal, it gives you Z ideal plus something. Good. Great. Okay. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, so the idea is we canceled noise with noise, and this is what I mean by noise canceling headset. Because this can get a little bit abstract and complicated, here's an analogy. So I, I apologize for using a drunkard man, but it's a famous classical statistics uh, example. Um, let's see, uh, who here has heard of the random walk? Okay, good. Okay, so you have a random walk. There's a lamppost. And of course, there's a drunk man under the lamppost who stumbles either one step to the right or one step to the left with probability bias P. So if there's no bias, uh, the drunk man uh, will start in the middle and sort of diffuse, but the average of his random walks will always be at the center of the post. And on average, we want the drunk man to stay where he is. We don't want him to go anywhere. But because there's an error, there's a little bit of a bias, he has a limp, um, there's a probability bias P, which will cause the drunk man on average to diffuse to the right. And so if you look at the evolution of uh, the ensemble of drunk, or, drunk man walking, you notice at time T0, let's say he's pretty much localized at the lamppost. And as time goes on, two things happen. Uh, the, the average, uh, on average, he stumbles to the right, and also you get a diffusion. So you get a drift and diffusion, right? So how could we fix this if we have no access to information of what the drunk man is doing at each time step? It's basically like doing error mitigation without error correction. So without monitoring the system, what we could do, basically what we're doing in PEC is we're adding a second random process, a second random walk on top of the first, where at each time step, a uh, little cloud comes along and blows the drunkard man with randomness, either to the left or to the right. But this time, the cloud does it with a probability bias Q that precisely is equal and opposite to the drunk man's probability bias. So what happens in this case when you have two random walks where the drifts are exactly equal and opposite well, what you get is that on average, the drunk man doesn't go anywhere because the two biases precisely cancel each other. However, what you get is that the quadratures, the variances add. And so what happens is that this, uh, this, this, this uh, shape here diffuses faster. And this is pretty much what we're seeing in the quantum case, except we're doing it in Hilbert space and we're doing it with gates where you you have a bias that's due to the quantum noise. And we also introduce a second random walk, if you want, which is our lambda inverse. And now it uh, just kicks us left and right. On average, we end up staying where we want, but the variance is going to uh, grow. Yeah. Maybe I'm going to use the analogy too literally, but I mean, <laughs> this is a really uh, accurate depiction of what you 
doing because like if I just think about a channel as noise, yep. we know that we can't invert the noise channel from a crystal channel. We have to help you with both processes. Three multiply by the set time. Right. Um, I think, you, let me see if I could follow that. So in the normal case, there are two things that happen. One is that, uh, yes, you, you lose signal because of the damping of the noise. And that already causes an increase in the variance uh, of the number of shots you would need to take. And secondly, you also have uh, the extra problem of having to have this quasi-probability distribution, the sign problem, which leads to this factor gamma that you have to rescale by. And that gamma basically leads to your, your, your variance blowing up even further. Um, not sure if that answered your question though. Partially, okay. We can we can follow up. Good. Okay. Good. Any other question on this? Yeah. Yeah. The question is, what's the error bar? What's the scaling? Um, I will touch on that uh, in a in actually the next couple of slides, but. You know, kind of coming back to this simple picture here, if I now ask what's the variance of this random variable E, you notice that that is, that that's going to go like, uh, so, okay, maybe I should be explicit and say, you know, the variance of some number A times the random variable X is just, you know, A squared times the variance of X. So of course here we get the exact same thing. So you get the gamma squared times the variance of the rest of the quantities. Um, da, 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 something like that. And notice that in this case, the signs won't matter very much. Um, you, you won't have the signs. You just have the, the uh, probabilities of the two different bit flips. You know, the variance for a, bind, uh, for a Bernoulli random variable, uh, one that's, you know, plus one and, that one that's zero and one will go, will depend on the probability, which is getting me ahead of where I want to be right now because that's in a couple of slides. So let me come back to that. Okay, and you had a question as well. Uh, you want to minimize Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, great. Yes, yeah, this is a great, this is actually the first time somebody's made that comment in this slide, which is which is great. So you guys are great audience, thank you. Um, the, the comment or question, more of a comment, is that this is one way to get rid of the bias, but why would you do this? There's an even simpler thing you could do. You could add a deterministic process that just pushes the, the man to the left. Well, that's kind of like saying we want a deterministic dilation of the block sphere. So the problem is that that's not an allowed operation in the quantum setting. Of course, here, yes, you could you could do that. But if I restrict the space of what you are allowed to do, and you can't just add a deterministic operation, because in the quantum setting, to keep the analogy faithful, we can't add that dilation. Um, so the analogy sort of breaks down in this case there. But that's a good comment. Yeah. Exactly. You're absolutely right. So the second comment here, and thank you for that, is that if you could actively monitor the system, the man, then you would know exactly which step the man took. Then you would just push him correspondingly to the left or the right. Again, that's something that in today's devices we can't do. We can't monitor the system actively to see whether it had an error or not. So we have to, of course, do that in error correction, as you nicely mentioned. But it's a, it's a question of what's available as a resource, as an operation to us. Yeah. I think I'll close the analogy uh, to deterministic uh, putting the attack with the 
the circuit is if it's got sampling the circuit with some probability, but sampling in a fixed number of repetition, a post ratio is a ratio of the probability. I think you let me see. yeah, I think the comment is that you could do it, you could not uh, sample in the way that I've mentioned, but there's a different way to sample it with some ratios. Is that roughly right? Yeah, and uh, well, I have to think about it. I'm not quite sure I know what you mean, but it doesn't point to me to a very good lesson here, which is that having, at least for me, having this kind of analogy, which is even loose, is helping me build some intuition that starts to generate more ideas of things to try in the quantum setting where things are a lot more abstract, right? And asking questions like, why not do it deterministically? And it brings me back to what Henri Poincaré said, which is that it's, it's by intuition that we discover, but by logic that we prove. Uh, so I think that's a useful sort of thing to keep in mind is that, yes, there are many ways you could approach this, and each one will have a slightly different uh, result and i agree that this may not what i've presented may not be the optimal sampling strategy in fact in other techniques like twirling the readout if you do readout error mitigation you can very quickly show that if you just randomly sample the variance is kind of big but if you do a sampling where you correlate the random polys that you sample basically you for each poly you negate it so if you have an x uh you then give an i you can show that the variance converges is much, much smaller, or the convergence is much, much faster. So I think to answer your question exactly, we'd have to chat more afterwards. But but the idea is, I think, very good to have these ideas and see that, yeah, there are many different ways to do the sampling. You can do important sampling also, right? These can lead to different convergence rates. And I'm so happy we're talking so much about con variances and convergences, because that tells me that the next few slides will be useful. No, OK, great. Okay, so you've got, you guys have all motivated this very well. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna go to this screen now on this side so that you guys uh, can see this as well. This is Deming. His uh, I think the 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 director of the first uh, statistics the first director of the statistical bureau of uh, in the U.S. and uh, he clearly didn't didn't have uh, trust in every human. Uh, <laughs> that's that's a light joke. So let's go back and just review very quickly how you think about this. So if I have a quantum state, any quantum state, it could be a noisy or ideal quantum state, I put it through a meter for one qubit that has two possible outcomes, one or zero, and that gives me a random classical variable x. That x can take on different values. So assume my alphabet of possible values, by alphabet I mean a non-empty finite set, uh, is zero or one. To get the probability that corresponds to each outcome, I can define some measurement operator, or POVM, which for the qubit is very simple. And so my distribution uh, of over the different outcomes x is either p or one minus p, just like this. And you can relate that to properties of the quantum state. Though on the classical side, on the statistics side, of course, that, that's a random variable that has a, that's, Bernoulli distributed, and its expectation value is precisely the probability p, because zero times anything is zero, and so you only get p times one. And the variance is p times one minus p. It's important to note this variance isn't a problem with the measurement device. This is fundamental to quantum physics. This is the uh, projection noise. So you can't get away from that. And if you, by the way, remember the very first curve we showed you, uh, I showed you of the decaying signal of our experiment, there was some fluctuations on the curve of that decaying exponential in sign. Part of those fluctuations come precisely from this term. And these terms vary, right? They depend. Uh, if your probability is zero or one for the qubit, then you have a deterministic number with no variance. Now, it's not particularly illustrative to only look at one single measurement, one single instance of the circuit. You have to flip the coin toss of the measurement many, many times in order to acquire statistics. And so what we do in all quantum experiments is we run many instances of the quantum circuit. Here, let's say it's M instances. Each one gives you a random variable X. They're all 
equally, uh, they're all uh, identically and independently distributed. And they all obey the same statistics determined by the uh, measurement operators on your quantum state. So what we keep asking about is how much can I trust my answer? Well, all my answers are going to be averages. And the average here, let's call it S for the, for the average quantity. This is my uh, statistic that is going to be an estimate of the mean value. It's just the average over all my outcomes, X, M. Okay, you can you know, try to, if you're watching the video, I suppose, pause the video, try to work this out yourself. Since you guys are more advanced students, I'm, I'm not going to bore you with all the details of just walk quickly over the idea that it, as you take this classical expectation value, you use the, uh, use the idea that each shot is identical and has exactly the same probability P and you use the linearity of the expectation value operator, you can find out that this that the mean of S is an unbiased estimator. So coming back to the earlier question, is an unbiased estimator of the expectation of the uh, quantum expectation value of the measurement operator M hat that is determined from, uh, that is diagonal in the measurement basis. And that has a probability P. And you can do the same thing for the variance. And you'll find that as you increase the number of shots, the variance decreases. And it decreases exactly as uh, one over M that's basically the central limit theorem. Uh, and so your standard deviation will go down. So what does this actually look like in practice? So I think it's illustrative to now look at a picture rather than the derivation. As you increase the number of shots, the sample mean you can possibly obtain will have more and more possible values that occur with a different probability. Right, And as you increase how many shots you've taken, so 10 shots, 18, 20, 50, 100, what happens is that you see more dots, which indicate that uh, more and more possible values that you could find. You know, If you only take one shot, S can only be zero or one. If you take two shots, S can only be zero, a quarter, 0 0.75, or one, so and so on. And you notice that what happens is you get a concentration as you increase the number of shots. And it's, this is exactly the binomial distribution. Now, the mean value of uh, this distribution is precisely the estimate of P, the probability. This is what we mean by the unbiased estimator. The part we keep coming back to is what is the uh, variance or what is the error bar around that estimate? Because each time I run my experiment, I'm going to get an S value that lies anywhere here on this curve. So even though the true S value, the true estimate should be 0.5, there's still a chance, it's a very small chance, but there's a chance that I could get zero, even if I do 100 shots. So how can I trust that you know, the value I get is truly significant? Okay, before I answer that, I know this went a little fast, so let me just check in if there are any questions. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I think the, the question is, um, you know, I said that there each shot is IID independent and identically distributed. How true is that in reality? And the answer is that not notionally or nominally, it's true. It's absolutely true. But in practice, what happens is the machine drifts, your calibrations drift, the noise drifts a little bit. So there's a little bit of fluctuation around it. For the most part, it's negligible in practice. But if you push things to the limits, you have to then worry about it. And that's sort of when ex experience comes in. Okay. Great. So the way to formally do this or properly do this isn't to look at variances, but is rather to look at uh, concentration measures on the distributions. So this is usually the way that computer scientists approach this problem in sort of probabilistic programming, where you say, okay, I want to ask 
okay, this is an estimator. It has some mean value. It's an unbiased estimator. What is the, I want to say that with some confidence delta or one minus delta with probability one minus delta, which I get to choose. So for instance, it could be 95%, 99%. I want to guarantee or certify that the value I will find in my experiment for this many shots will not deviate outside of that value. In other words, I want to know that I have an additive error on my estimate of plus minus epsilon with a confidence of say 99, 95%. And the way to do that is to say that you basically you want to know what the area under the center of this curve is determined by epsilon. While I'll show this to you here for this simple one qubit example, this is what all the theory papers do in practice, except they do it you know, for n qubits with operator norms and, and so on and so on. But the idea is the same. So this is how we certify all these error mitigation methods is by using these kind of concentration or tail bounds. To give you a slightly more formal view, the way this works is by recognizing that the central limit theorem will pretty much make things look normal at some level. This is a normal distribution. And you can use that uh, idea and a little bit more thought to define what's known as the chernoff hofting uh, inequality. So this is the chernoff hofting two-sided inequality, which works for any combination of random variables, O of X, which could be anything, as long as it's bounded by minus one and plus one. And from there, you can find that effectively the area outside of this curve, the, the fat tails or the tails, if you want, of the curve, um, the probability to find yourself in, in this red region will be smaller than delta, which is a parameter you get to pick. That's the confidence you want. Uh, that's determined by an exponential quantity. It's exponential in the number of shots as well as epsilon squared, which is the precision that you care about, the additive precision. So all of these actual guarantees and discussions that we talk about in quantum computing, probabilistic classical computing, and error mitigation aren't based on the variance itself. They're generally based on concentration inequalities or tail bounds like this. Um, the failure probability, delta, is something you get to pick as a user of the algorithm. And you also get to pick epsilon. What you're interested in as a user is how many shots should I run, especially if uh, it takes a, some time to run each shot of the quantum circuit. You want to understand, uh, you basically solve this expression, fixing delta and fixing epsilon, you solve for m. And you can find that m, the number of shots you need to take, scales as one over the additive error squared that you're interested in, times the logarithm of one over delta. Now, this second part, the logarithm of delta, usually people want 95, 99% confidence, or they want something you know, greater than two thirds. That pretty much uh, is a fixed quantity. It doesn't change very much because it's this log of one over delta. So you can get rid of that and say that the number of shots you will need to take uh, to have this, to have high confidence that you have an error bar of plus minus epsilon, is roughly four over the additive error squared. So that's, that's the basic equation that will show up again and again and again in pretty much every protocol. The only thing that will change is the prefactor in front of this epsilon squared. Yes? Uh, so given that your probability distribution for S is pretty much always Gaussian by the central limit theorem, how important is really to distinguish between the concentration measure and just looking at the variance? Yeah, the question is, well, you know, this thing will always look Gaussian, but, you know, suppose that P, um, so by the way, this is, this will be valid for, what I haven't mentioned is this will be valid for any, any distribution. Okay. So the distribution that I start with doesn't have to be Gaussian, doesn't even have to converge to a Gaussian. They don't necessarily always converge to Gaussian. For instance, in this case, you know, if you have something very close to the edge, for you know, hundred, a thousand shots, it could look very non-Gaussian, but this kind of concentration bound will tell you that whatever p is, I don't know what p is, it will always be bounded by this. So it's a much more powerful technique than just using variances uh, alone, um, which indeed work most of the time. 
but you can make much broader statements, much more rigorous statements using these kind of concentration inequalities. Yeah. So you're saying this holds also if the central limit theorem does not hold? Uh, let's see. I have to think about that carefully because there's a lot that goes under that. This holds under very weak assumptions. Um, I don't know if it's equivalent to the central limit theorem i don't i think it's a little broader but i'd have to really sort of sit down and think about it what it does require is that you don't have some distribution that you know blows up or like the moments or cumulants don't blow up uh, as, as it will you don't have these um, um non-convergent distributions or things that kind of like where the cumulants effectively grow if you know what i mean uh yeah, so there are some conditions, but they're very mild, and they're roughly equivalent to the central limit theorem, but a little bit broader. And again, you could have, you know, the idea is that this is true for any probability p. It's also so. You know, the other challenge here is um, for this case, you you want to know what p is, right? Uh, the, because the actual variance will depend on p. So that's the other thing that's really important here. If you here, you would have to calculate p, and you know, in this expression, I would have to figure out what's the p for xi and the p for xx. Whereas in using this kinds of approaches, I say it works for any p. I don't need to actually do much calculation. All I need to know is what are the bounds of my classical random variables, and just from that, I can say the worst case error is such and such. So it's a bit, bit broader. Okay, good. Um, Maybe one statement that's useful to remember here is that knowing you're not wrong is cheaper than knowing you're right. Uh, in other words, it turns out that it's much cheaper to uh, increase delta, the confidence interval. You can go from 95 to 99% without having to add many shots. So the confidence grows very quickly. But trying to grow the precision, that's very hard. That's, that, that takes a lot more shots. And so these curves here actually tell you if you run your quantum experiment tomorrow and you get zeros and ones or ones and minus ones, how many shots would I need to sample in order to be confident that I have an additive precision of you know, 0.1 or 0.001? And you notice that going from precision of 0.1, which is about 1,000 shots, to going to precision of uh, 0.01 from 10% to 1% you know, requires 100 times uh, more shots. It, it, the scaling goes like the standard deviation but the actual analytical analysis is a bit more broad. Yeah, if you're interested in these concentration inequalities, uh, I'll spare you the details here, but there's a very detailed cheat sheet you can find. Uh, okay, good. Now, I think in the interest of, of time, I will skip this general derivation, but I, I'm happy to share the notes in the offline version of of this talk. And rather than that, I'll just skip ahead to the next question, which is how do you actually learn the noise? Good. Now that, yeah. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> so, yeah now I've said that the resistance to the go exponential. How is that Oh, yeah, yeah. Good, good. Great question. Um, I'll get to that at, more at the end, but the question is, okay, it looks like the sampling complexity grows uh, really badly, or it will grow exponentially, and you're right, it will grow exponentially also as a function of the depth of the circuit, because gamma will increase exponentially, because basically the noise will multiply, so the gamma per layer will multiply, so you get gamma to the power of d, where d is the depth, and that's true, it grows exponentially, which is why we need quantum error correction at the end of the day. However, the trick here is that gamma will be small, so it will grow weakly exponentially. Um, not only that, there's some more advanced things you can do, which is that you can use these techniques. You can use these techniques to reduce your effect of gamma. For instance, if you only consider noise that matters for the observable you care about, you can make a light cone argument just like Lieb-Robinson bounds and all these things, you can throw out a bunch of the gates and reduce your effect of gamma. And that will reduce the effect of sampling overhead that you need. Um, on top of that, you can do uh, some, some of the sign problems in post-processing. People have looked at that. That can reduce your overhead even further. 
And in the final sort of recent nature paper that just came out that, that we have one of the authors here in the room, um, in that paper, we, this technique was combined with zero noise extrapolation to vary in a deterministic way the amount of noise. So rather than trying to stretch the gates and say, oh, my nose is you know, roughly two times bigger or something, where we don't really know how that works, you can use this technique to very um, precisely control the amount of noise in the system. And that allows you to have a much more, uh, much better extrapolation back to the ideal values. So basically, this is this this is a branching point for many different directions um, that allow you to reduce or this exponential overhead more and more and more. Okay, great. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah, the question is, are there no-go theorems that say what the scaling should be and so on? Um, well, I think it goes in part exponentially. So there are two reasons. As a function of depth, you know, when you have noise, the noise tends to multiply together if it's incoherent. So I'm talking about incoherent noise only. And so that tends to accumulate in an exponential way. So you get gamma, you know, you get the, the noise decay of the first instance, the noise decay of the second layer, third layer, and so on. So you're always getting the shrinking of the block sphere and they, they that's multiplicative. So that's that's one reason. The other is, uh, as you notice, that as, as you decay, that means that the signal is shrinking. The signal is exponentially decaying, and that decay leads to an exponential overhead in the sampling complexity and the number of shots you need to take. Now, that's sort of the, the quick rough picture. Beyond that, there's there are papers that have recently come out which talk about fundamental uh, bounds or even no-goes on error mitigation and are able to make quite general statements about very broad classes of strategies like PEC. And they have shown that you can reduce gamma, but there's, there is a fundamental limit on just how much. So there are, there is some understanding that some of this appears to be fundamental, but I'm always cautious to say it's fundamental because oftentimes, you know, we come up with tricks that allow you to bypass these things uh, that allow you to learn things say better. Uh, or, or get around these. So yes, there are fundamental constraints, but there may also be ways around them. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, so as, as we mentioned, the challenge, is, as a lot of you alluded to, the challenge is that we need to both sample a lot and we need to know exactly what the noise is. So knowing precisely what the noise is is very useful for a number of of tasks like beyond device characterization, gate tuning, uh, error mitigation, also quantum simulation. So this is why we really want to try to understand it. However, that's very hard and difficult, especially in superconducting quantum processors where the device is subject to all kinds of noise. I, I can't even list all of them, you know, even things like cosmic rays matter, right? Um, so how do you deal with that? And part of the answer will be that we're going to abstract things away. Now, the second issue with this approach or challenge is that in practice, you need to know the full noise in principle perfectly. And to give you a sense of what that means, let's say you have two qubits, that's 255 parameters of the noise you would need to learn for a general CPTP map. If you have 50 qubits, you will need to learn 10 to the 60 parameters. That's about 10 to the 50 gigabytes of memory to store in your computer. And I don't have 10 to the 50 gigabytes of RAM. I don't know if anybody here does. Um, not only that, you also need to know these values of the noise, this P with really, really high precision, right? Because usually P is 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus three. So you want that additive precision to, to be really small, which leads to really large sampling. So you have several issues. You need to both take into account all the crosstalk, the correlated errors, the parallel gates, 
And you also need a technique that's uh, efficient, it's scalable, it's accurate, and ultimately has some kind of compact, tractable representation that can express 10 to the 60 parameters. Because we know that the noise isn't sparse in, in uh, say, necessarily all of these, but maybe there's some structure underneath that that we can take advantage of because we can't write down this many things. So that's the idea of, that's the setup for the challenge to learn noise. So coming back to our picture of an n-qubit circuit where you have some uh, multi-qubit gate layer u with some noise channel lambda, this is basically the first idea I had that started this whole project, which was that, well, what if we simplify the noise? If the noise is hard, make it simple, right? And so the idea here is that you take your noise channel lambda and you apply a number of random polys on each side of the channel. What that will do is that will scramble any coherent phases. Not only that, because the polys form a two or maybe even a three design, that leads to a number of cancellations, which if you scan this, you can sort of walk through very nicely a tutorial that explains why that works. Uh, but here I'll just let you, yes, Steve? Maybe this. Uh, yes. <laughs> Yes, um, the question, the, the comment is what's a design? Um, the short answer is you don't need to know for this talk or this lecture. The long answer is that, uh, the long answer is that in this case for this group, it means that it's somehow, uh, it has a special property and that property means that an average, if you basically, if you sample over it or if you average, it's going to give you um, so let, let me rephrase that. If you want to find the average over the block sphere of some function, right? You have a function over the block sphere. Uh, you might want, you, you need to do an integral over four pi to the radians. A design means that the value of that average is going to be equal to the value of a sum over just a few points. Um, as long as the function you're asking about is say as a polynomial of degree n. So that gives you a design of degree n. It's a bit technical. I don't think I really need to maybe spend uh, too much emphasis on it. But the idea is that effectively it looks like as if you had averaged over all possible unitaries your function, but you only needed to in practice average over certain directions or points that somehow are cardinal in the space, like the polys, you know, the, the, uh, in the block sphere, they're, they're cardinal points that give you the same answer. So I'm sorry if that sounds very convoluted and a little bit technical uh, and, and uh, I don't plan to mention it ever again. Okay, thank you, Steve. <laughs> um, maybe Steve will give us a design lecture tomorrow. So if you twirl over all these uh, channels and effectively take this as a template that you can use and reuse, and if you're interested in details, go to this tutorial. It means that any noise channel you have is going to get simplified in a dramatic way where all of its off diagonal elements, and I mean off diagonal in this kind of poly basis, where you can, as you know, write any channel as PA row PB, where A and B are two different indices of the polys, all the off diagonal elements get killed, they go to zero, and you're only left with uh, the diagonal elements of the channel. In other words, this matrix, which was four to the n by four to the n, now becomes a diagonal matrix that only has four to the n numbers. So we just got an exponential saving in the number of parameters we need to learn. However, uh, that's still uh, a large number of parameters. The question then is, how do you actually learn this noise channel lambda? And uh, the trick is to know that a poly conjugated by a poly always gives you the same poly. In other words, what that leads you to find out is that the eigenvectors of this noise channel lambda are polys themselves. So PA here is some poly on n qubits. If I apply the noise channel lambda to that poly, because for instance, it's a component in the density matrix, all I get back is, a, is some coefficient, some number called the fidelity, 
which is between one and minus one, that gives me back the same poly. What that means is that uh, if, you, if you think of the picture of the block sphere that we saw of the bit flip channel, you notice that each of the directions was shrinking which at some rate. That rate is exactly this fidelity. So if I prepare an X state and I apply the channel lambda, the channel will just rescale, will uh, downsize if you want my uh, block coefficient by this number F. And that's really a key property and it's very important because it allows you to come up with a scheme that can help you to learn the noise. And that's because if you take the channel lambda now and you apply it over and over and over again, it means that if, if I started in an eigenstate of lambda, each time I'm going to get another fidelity FA. And if I repeat it uh, many times, we're going to just find that, uh, so let me skip here because the equation is down here at the bottom. If you apply the channel lambda K times, you simply take that fidelity and you raise it to the kth power. Uh, this is what we mean by the exponential damping of this noise, of incoherent noise. Okay. So what you would then do to learn the noise is in principle, you would just prepare different eigenstates, different poly bases. So I would prepare X, the noise channel would shrink X and I would measure X and that would tell me the fidelity in X. I would prepare Z, the noise channel would shrink Z, and I would measure in Z. And that would tell me how much it shrunk by, it would tell me what the fidelity is. And by doing many repetitions and getting these exponential curves, it allows me to not just take a point and go back, I can fit an exponential decay, and that has much better precision. It allows me to move from uh, additive precision to multiplicative precision, maybe a little technical, but effectively it means that the number of shots I need to sample has a much, much better scaling. Yeah, question. Uh, how does M scale uh, with this program? Because on one hand, you're adding one place. Uh, it seems like the variance plan. On the other hand, uh, you're, you're kind of going down. Going yeah. Down. Going yeah. Down. yeah. Yeah. The question is how how does the uh, noise uh, how does the noise scale uh, how does the sampling scale? Maybe two comments. Let's say you had a, a coherent channel here. What happens with coherent errors is that they kind of they add like sines and cosines, and what that leads to is a worst case error that goes quadratically with with the error or with the depth uh, with the number of repetitions. So the, the worst case bound, sometimes called the diamond norm, goes quadratically with, uh, in, in the case of coherent error because coherent errors add very well. It's kind of like ballistic transport, right? On the other hand, if you have incoherent errors, which is what this is, basically you scramble the phases, it's kind of like taking that you know, ballistic transport and adding some, some uh, impurities along the way, and now you get diffusive transports, so you get a kind of a square root difference. So the way that the errors add is square root smaller. So instead of getting this quadratic add up and build up of the errors along the way, in the worst case, you get linear worst case error. So in general, it can be better to have incoherent noise rather than coherent noise of the same strength because the way that it, the errors add is, is more mild. Yeah. Oh, the question is, why do you need to amplify the noise? Right. The reason is because um, this FA, this, these fidelities, I want to suppose that this fidelity here is 0.999, and I want an error bar of 0 0.00001. <laughs> um, that means that I need to take 0 0.0001 like one over 0 0.0001 squared shots. So that's something like 10 million shots. Uh, we just did actually the derivation. It's one over epsilon squared, if you remember the tail bound. So 10 to the minus four, one over 10 to the minus four squared is 10 to the eight. Uh, it's 100 million shots, excuse me. That's, that's way too many shots. I can't do the, um, that many shots. Um, so we need a better procedure, something that doesn't have this really bad scaling for the additive error in epsilon. 
And the trick here is that if you if you don't just sample it directly, but rather you look at this exponential decay curve, because you're looking at this decay curve, you're amplifying the error. That amplification can can basically reduce uh, can can reduce that the error you find to not be additive. So you know x plus or minus epsilon, but multiplicative. So the error becomes sort of one plus epsilon times x. Uh, so it's uh, yes, we'll get to what the curves look like in just a second. Exactly. Exactly. Um, we're we're going to sample. We're going to not sample, but we're going to deterministically choose a few k values so that we get a decaying curve, which will come in a second. Yeah. I have a gamma here. Uh, also ah, good question. Yes. Yeah, so in this slide, you would want to twirl each of the lambdas. That's right. Uh, independently. Independently. That's right. Because you want to turn this, you know, ballistic into diffusive transport, basically. That's right. Um, good. Now I'll I'll have some slides here which we won't walk through. But if you're interested, in when we post the lectures, it kind of walks through the actual math that goes with this. Um, the conclusion at the end of the day is that this is all very nice, but it doesn't actually work for what we're interested in. And that's because we don't just have the noise lambda, but we also have this layer of entangling gates. And the problem is that the entangling gates are going to screw up this relationship of the eigenvalue amplification because the entangling operations are going to scramble, not scramble, but they're going to mix different eigenvectors and eigenvalues together. To, to illustrate the point, uh, recall that if I apply the poly if I apply a lambda on a poly operator, I just get the fidelity of that, basically just how much it decays. So imagine the poly that comes in, maybe I've prepared my qubit in uh, two qubits in XY. So here's a two qubit example. I come in with an XY poly, which gets hit by lambda, which decreases its amplitude by the fidelity of the xy term, because that's what this came in. It also leaves me in the xy state. However, then I have a, a, a C naught, a controlled x gate. The controlled x gate will, in this case, take the value, uh, will take xy and it will move it to the poly yz. So it will swap these around. Then I hit, I come back to the channel lambda. This time, lambda doesn't see the same poly anymore. It sees a different poly. It sees the poly uh, yz. So it hits it by a fidelity fyz. I come back to the x gate that flips it to xy, since c naught squared is the identity. And so the output I get is that my xy component is scaled not by one eigenvalue, but by two, the product of two of them. In this case, it's actually easy to fix this because you can use single qubit gates after the first CX to uncover the information. So you can take a Y to an X and you can take the Z back to a Y with just single qubit rotations. And you can actually get rid of uh, the issue of this product of fidelities here. However, there's a case where this doesn't work. And this is when you talk about uh, where the entangler is actually entangling something. So if I start the first qubit, the first qubit will start, uh, will have an X poly and the second one will have an I poly. That comes into the channel lambda, it gets reduced by the fidelity FXI. However, when the CX, the control not gate sees that uh, poly, it now turns the I into an X. Okay. Um, this is unrecoverable with local operations because I can't take any single qubit gate and rotate my X state into the I state, right? That doesn't happen. It's just not possible with unitaries. And that's, this is an expression of uh, moving information from local to non-local space. So then uh, you come back to the channel lambda, you get uh, some other fidelity fxx. And so now you're stuck with the product of these fidelities. 
Now, I won't exactly walk you, I won't walk you through understanding what's local and non-local, but suffice it to say there are some things you can recover and some things you can't recover if you look at how a CNOT or a CX is going to move the polys around. Uh, someone had asked about no-go theorems earlier. There's a no-go theorem in this case that you can't learn the noise in the way you want uh, in, in this setting. Nonetheless, there's some tricks we can play uh, which allow us to come up with some sequence. And this is now a little technical, so I'm going to skip that part. But we can come up with a sequence that looks very much like the, the one we started with, but is able to, for the most part, with a very weak assumption about sim some symmetry in the noise, it's going to break that uh, type of degeneracy and will allow us to recover the final data. Okay. So to the question about what does the actual data or experiment look like, in this case, you start with uh, not applying the actual gate or a noise at, at all. And then you apply the noisy gate 20 times, 40 times, 60 times, 80 times. And you notice that initially we've started in an eigenstate of that uh, channel. Let's say it's, it's one. If there was no noise, all of these curves would just look like one. These are all different expectation values of polys. So for instance, if I have two polys, over here I can plot uh, the expectation value of IZ, ZI, ZZ, and so on. These are different components of, of the density matrix. But because the noise is getting applied again and again and again with my entangling gate, these components decay. The really nice part is that each of these decays is going to encode the product of two of the fidelities. And because we're fitting curves as opposed to looking at individual points, the uh, error bar with which you can fit that fidelity, and you notice these are pretty high numbers, you know, 0.9942, you can really get very small error bars. So this is a general trick you can use in, in many different uh, data experiments is to try to move things into a place where you're fitting exponentials because things tend to converge very well. So here for each case, you get many, many curves. You can do this for just nine different bases that will allow you to now get uh, lots and lots of products of fidelities. Okay, so from this set of curves and experimental data, you can now try to figure out how do I unravel these products of fidelities back to the case where, back to these coefficients of the noise channel, CA. The challenge here is that there's still four to the n of them. And so this is where we need some rescue because there's still too many things to even just physically write down. I just can't even store that in my computer. So some of you yesterday had mentioned or asked about the limb platform or how do you do this more tractably. The idea is uh, to, use, to use not the actual channel, but to use the generator of the channel. Just the same way that we don't talk about unitaries all the time, but we talk about Hamiltonians. Oftentimes the Hamiltonian will be sparse, the unitary will not be sparse. So we're going to play the exact same trick here, except this time it's for noise channels. And what we have to do is assume some kind of um, form of the actual generator of the noise that is simple, that has just a few coefficients. I think in your earlier lectures, you saw uh, the dissipator, the, the Limblad operator. In this case, we can assume that the generator of this noise is given by a sum of independent uh, terms that have that are just polys, based on polys. The jump operator is a poly. And to make things simple, we can make the assumption that these polys have to somehow respect the connectivity of an actual quantum chip, of an actual quantum process. So for instance, here's a heavy hexagonal lattice. Each dot here would be one qubit. So I'll only allow polys that, so for instance, a poly, I can't have a poly that has an operator on this qubit here and that qubit there because they're not connected. So I can make myself only have you know, one local or two local or three local polys according to this topology. 
Now, there's some notes here Ed, that will be left that talk about how this works and, and sort of the math under it, if you're interested. I'm going to just keep this at the level, at a high level for now, and say that, you know, kind of following some of the algebra there, looking at all those curves that give you many products of actual fidelities, a bunch of math and magic happens, and it allows you to find these lambdas, these actual coefficients uh, lambda here. And so from the exact curves you saw earlier, if we go back to, to the many decays here, you can just in classical post-processing process the data and crunch out exactly what these coefficients lambda are that will tell you what the errors are on single qubits here for a four qubit system that has two C naught gates in parallel. So this is now real experimental data. And you notice that I have polys that only act on qubit one and is either the X, the Y, or the Z poly in the generator. Similarly, here's qubit four that has either an X error, a Y error, or a Z error that's generated on it. You notice that the value of these bars is really, really small. It's 10 to the minus three. So this is why we needed all this machinery of understanding the error bars and all this machinery of you know, amplifying the error and so on. The errors on these quantum devices are actually pretty small. They're not as small as we would like, but they're still pretty small numbers. Nonetheless, using this idea of twirling, amplifying the error, um, fitting exponentials, and doing a sparse model, you know, combining these four or five ideas, you can begin to find out a fingerprint that looks at the exact detail of the noise. So assuming this is right, which I haven't yet shown you, this is a, a fingerprint that precisely characterizes what the noise is. It tells me that actually in my four qubit system here with these two qubit gates, almost all the noise isn't due so much to the qubit uh, to the non log to the qubit qubit interaction, which would be something like a poly between one and four. This is a two qubit uh, term. It's actually mostly due to the single qubit terms. In other words, because my two qubit gates take a long time, my dominant error doesn't really necessarily come from, from the interaction I'm having that's non local and in involves multiple terms. It's mostly coming from just the fact that. The gates are long and I have T1, I have T2, you know, these are the normal, the amplitude damping uh, dissipation of just single individual sites. You notice that qubits four and seven, which have no interaction between them, have pretty much no uh, noise acting on them in their generator, while the qubits that do have C naughts on them do indeed have some kind of noise. But for the most part, the single qubit noise tends to, tends to aggregate more. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. The question is, um, yesterday I mentioned that single qubit gates are much better than two qubit gates, and that's because the error of the two qubit gates is much higher than that of the single qubit gates. And but here it might look like the single qubits have worse error. Um, what I said is still true. The resolution is that this noise you see here only happens when you play the two qubit gate. It's only, this is a picture of the noise that's attached to that two qubit gate. So if I don't have that two qubit gate, I won't have this. Um, the single qubit gates are much, much shorter in time. Normal, usually they're on these devices, there's something like 30 nanoseconds. These gates can be something like 500 nanoseconds. So just by virtue of the two qubit gates taking so much more time for creating this kind of interaction between the two qubits that has this, that is strong, they get penalized much more by underlying noise processes that are actually local, that actually have only to do with the one qubit. But the single qubit gates are just you know, an order of magnitude or two faster. And so they don't get penalized as much. But what this tells us is that the two qubit gate error isn't actually so much necessarily due to two qubit in error channels. It's actually mostly originating from the one qubit ones, right? So from a practical point of view, these kinds of things get very important and interesting when you can diagnose what's actually happening under the hood. 
Okay, good, excellent. Um, you can take that same picture and now scale it up to many more qubits. So here's now a 27 qubit chip. And instead of plotting a bar histogram with uh, many, many, many bars, I can instead plot the channel generators in a way where each qubit is represented by a little circle. And in that circle, there's three possible generators of error, X, Y, and Z. And so I can depict them as X, Y, and Z here. And I'll color code just how strong the terms are. So for instance, on qubit five, you notice that there's a very strong shading in the bottom right. That tells me that there's a lot, a lot of Z error that's being generated there. On, uh, on the edges, we can look at all the two qubit polys. So there's uh, nine of them, XX, XY, YY, ZZ, and so on. And I can put them in a little rectangle like this and uh, picture them as well. So this is effectively a full picture, full, a full map of the noise, assuming that the noise is at most too local. You notice I'm only point, po plotting circles, which are one local noise generators, and rectangles, which are two local generators. Because it's the generators of this noise, um, and you then take this picture and you exponentiate it to find the channel, it actually means that the channel, this lambda, has four to the n terms. It's just that those four to the n terms are not all independent, but are rather concisely and compactly represented by a small number of coefficients, which I can summarize here. Okay, so the number of uh, coefficients in the channel would be something like four to the 20th here, but I can only use a few numbers to actually picture these. And then the point is you can go higher and scale this up. The actual learning time, which is uh, pretty much constant. So the, the amount of time it took to learn this map, to learn this map and to learn this 127 qubit map, which was used in, the, in this nature experiment was the same in terms of the actual time on the quantum computer. Okay. Now I haven't yet shown you that these maps actually represent reality. And the way to do that is to use them in the probabilistic error cancellation experiment and show you that in experiment, you can cancel the noise and find uh, the evolution of quantum models or quantum simulation as if it, there was no noise in the device, as long as you allow yourself to sample more and more time. And I think that's where I'll leave today because the next part will be to actually show you experimental results in lecture three and uh, take it from there. Good. Yeah, maybe one one or two final questions. Yeah. Yep. Uh, between, yes, the question is, so the C knots are depicted by these little uh, gray shapes. And even though there's no C knot, be, a gate between qubits one and qubits two, I still have noise between qubits one and two that actually is pretty strong on the x, 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 y, and x, z terms. Why is that? The answer is that even though uh, these two qubits aren't directly impacted, the fact that you're doing something to qubit two, you're putting a pulse on it, you're driving it, kind of like how, how Steve was showing us today in the cavities, there are all of these cross-current interactions, there are all these dispersive shifts, there are all these energy level diagrams that, that Steve drew for us, it means that qubits two frequency, which is an actual transmon that, that uh, Steve talked about, it's shifting around. And if it shifts around, it can run into a collision with some of the frequencies of qubit one. It actually gets even worse because they're not qubits. I think as Steve again showed us, they're multi-level atoms. And you have to worry about not just the bottom two transitions, but even the levels that are higher than that. And so what happens is that you have this... Uh, these uh, forests of energy levels moving around everywhere, and some of them can hit collisions under the application of these gates. And that can lead to these spectator errors. So even if qubit one was idle, nothing was happening to it, just because you apply something on qubit two can lead to an error on qubit one. And that's this kind of context-dependent crosstalk that, that is 
you know, the fidelities on the quantum devices all seem very nice, but when you run something together, usually the result is a lot worse because of all this correlated noise, all this context dependent crosstalk. And that's precisely what this method tries to capture very accurately. Awesome, good, good. Okay, I know it's lunchtime, so I think maybe with that, we uh, head to lunch.